Welcome to Karparo. Spring Boot is quite a buzzword nowadays and it's an essential skill to add in your resume. But you're here because you did not understand what exactly is Spring Boot. Well, I'm here to help you. Today, I guarantee that with this mini course, you will understand what is Spring Boot, its purpose, why it even came into existence along with a very simple example. But all I'm asking you is to avoid any distractions and watch this course completely. I've made this course for you in beginner friendly way. After you watch this video course, do let me know in the comments what you think, give me suggestions, ask questions or suggest me a topic for next video etc. I'll listen to you and I will respond to each and every comment. I also kept some useful links in the description which you can check after you finish watching. Ok so let's jump in. Here is a quick outline of what we will learn today. Initially we will start off by understanding some of the setup requirements and then we will see how we can install JDK, how to set up Maven. We will also talk about a couple of Maven features which are actually the prerequisite for understanding Spring Boot. We will then understand what is Spring Boot and then we will understand what is Spring Boot Initializer, how we can use it and we're going to talk about a lot of features that Spring Boot offers like auto configuration, starter dependencies, embedded servers, etc. And of course, we're going to learn all these with example. If you already know Maven, then you can jump directly to Spring Boot. I will put the video timelines in the description. With that in mind, let's begin. I said this course is for beginners, but that being said, there are certain prerequisites for this course. The first of which is you need to have JDK installed. JDK stands for Java Development Kit. If you reach to a point where you wanted to learn Spring Boot, then I'm assuming that you're already able to run Java programs on your computer. And if you're able to run Java programs, that means you already have JDK installed. However, I'm going to walk you through real quick on how to install JDK just in case if you don't know how to do that. You also need to have some knowledge on any of the project management tools like Maven or Gradle. In my case, I'm going to be using Maven and in case if you don't know what is Maven, I'm also going to give you just enough knowledge on Maven in order to work on a Spring Boot project or the Spring Boot example that we're going to talk about. And I assume that you already have some knowledge on writing Java code, run it and see the result. Pretty obvious, right? And exposure to Spring Framework in general is an added advantage. But I'm going to give a glimpse of some of the Spring features in order to explain Spring Boot features. Hope it makes sense. Let's take a look at how we can install JDK on our computer. With a quick Google search on this term, JDK, I'm shown with these results. And if I click on the first link, I would land in this page should be able to see a download button to download JDK. Click on it, you should be able to download an artifact which is basically an installer and you can install JDK just as you would install any other software. It's quite easy and self-explanatory. Once you install JDK, it must have been installed in one of the directories and you should be able to spot all these folders and files. The next thing that you need to do inside Windows is to search for environment variables. Click on this button and add a Java home variable in this manner with the exact same name and you would point it to the JDK home directory like so. Once you do that you also need to add the path variable and you would point to the bin directory inside JDK home directory. This is the directory where you have all those Java tools to compile or run the programs. The significance of configuring these variables is if you go to the command prompt inside Windows I just pressed Windows R and type in CMD and in order to make sure everything is well and good just type in Java hyphen version and you should be able to see the version of JDK that you've just installed. You wouldn't be able to type this command and see the results 
if you had not configured those variables. Without those variables, you would have to go to the JDK directory and then to the bin directory in order to run this command. The next thing that you need to do is to open an IDE, something like Eclipse. In case if you're using any other IDEs, you need to do something similar. Inside Eclipse, you can click on Windows Preferences and search for installed JREs. Click on it and add JDK like so. You click on add and add the location of the JDK in this manner. So Eclipse is now going to use this JDK directory to find all the tools, libraries, etc. in order to in order for you to work on Java. Once you do that, click on apply and close. I've already done that. I don't have to do it again. But do make sure that you're able to create a very simple project and run a Hello World Java program. That way you're sure that everything is working well and good. So with this you should have JDK in place. Hope it makes sense. I don't know if you know anything about Maven, but I'm going to show you how to install Maven and then I'll walk you through some of the features offered by Maven that will help us with our Spring Boot examples. So again, I took help from our Google friend and search this query, download Maven. If you click on the first link, that would land you in this beautiful page. You just have to download one of these artifacts. I've done that already and have explored that artifact in one of the local directories or folders in Windows. Once I do so, I just have to install Maven just as the way I installed Java. I'm going to copy this, go to environment variables and let me tell you something. It's not mandatory that you need to install Maven in this manner. But this is necessary if you want to be able to run Maven commands from the command processor. And in fact, we can build our Spring Boot projects or create Spring Boot projects using Maven commands. So let me configure it. I'm going to add a new variable and it says Maven underscore home. It has to be the same name and should be uppercase just as you're seeing in here. The value is going to point to the home directory. I'm also going to edit the path variable and add maven variable as well. Let me just simply copy this, add a new one. But of course this should point to maven. Hit enter. OK, OK, send. OK, let's test our Maven installation with a quick command. That's mvn-version. And you should be able to see the version of the Maven that you've installed. I currently have the older version, but you should be seeing the latest version. Let me close this. Let me go to Eclipse. If you downloaded Eclipse very recently, then it comes built in with Maven capabilities. In order to check that, go to File, click on New, and click on project and you should be able to spot Maven in here. If you don't see it though, then you can go to help Eclipse Marketplace and search for Maven and just install one of the available plugins. But this is the one that works well. And that's how you install Maven. And again, don't worry about Maven. I'll briefly talk about it. For those who don't have any clue on what is Maven, I'm going to walk you through a couple of features offered by Maven that will help us in understanding the rest of the course. Maven comes with a lot of features and definitely talking about those features is beyond the scope of this course. In fact, Maven deserves a course on its own I do have a course for Maven, in fact, but definitely we're not going to pay attention to a whole list of features offered by Maven, but only two. So click on File, Project. We're going to create a Maven project. So under this section Maven, select Maven Project, click on Next, and just leave everything to default. We don't want to understand each and everything in here. Here you get to choose an artifact 
In short, an artifact is a predefined project structure depending on the type of project that you're going to work on. I mean, you could create an Android application, a web application, or a plugin, a Spring project, Spring Boot project, etc. Likewise, there are hundreds of artifacts available in Maven. If this sounds confusing, just leave this to default and click Next. Here we need to provide so-called project coordinates, which is a concept of Maven, but just follow along with me and give whatever I'm giving here. There are certain naming conventions that you need to follow. The best is to just type in exactly what I'm typing. Artifact ID is going to be whatever of your choice, but make sure that everything is lowercase. I'm going to call it some project or whatever. Click Finish. So this has created a Maven project for us. Everything looks similar to any other Eclipse project, but there's one significant difference. That is this file, form.xml. Form stands for Project Object Model, and it has a bunch of tags that Maven understands to perform a variety of tasks. Let me expand this. You can just ignore all the tags except a tag called dependency that goes inside dependencies. So in order to explain the purpose of this tag, let's open this app.java that is auto-generated by Maven. And I'm going to insert a piece of code that I already have inside this main method and save it. What we're trying to do with this code is that we're just simply going to create an Excel sheet in the following location. But we're seeing a lot of errors. That's because we don't have these classes inside our class path. JDK does not have a built-in support for these libraries that will help us work on Excel sheets. So for this purpose, we have to use any external libraries provided by someone else. So what you would normally do is you would go to the internet and search for the jar file, download it, keep it in a particular location in your computer, and then point to that particular location in order to use that library. But that's a lot of painstaking process, especially if your project is very big, and it really becomes hard to manage all those dependencies. It can easily mess things up. So Maven dependencies feature will come in handy. You don't have to do all that work. All you have to do is to go to internet and search for a particular library. So in my case, I want to use Apache POI library, which will help me work with Excel sheets and type in Maven. If you click on this link, let me click the latest version. So now I can just copy this particular tag and, and paste it inside list of dependencies. Once you do so, just right click on the project and click on Maven Update Project. It's going to take a while, especially if you're doing this for the first time, because what Maven is going to do, there's something called a central repository where everyone will keep all their libraries that they want to make them public. Maven is going to download that library depending on the coordinates that you provided in here into your local repository. And obviously if you're new to Maven, all this may sound confusing. So for now, you just have to think it in this manner. Once you add a particular dependency, Maven is going to manage everything. It's going to keep the jar file in a particular directory that your project has access to. Basically, it's going to keep it in the class path so that you can start using that library inside your project. Now if I do Control shift o we have everything in place. And by default, Maven uses older version of Java. So we have to update these two properties inside our project, like so. You can give any version of your choice. 
I want to leave it to 11 or I could just give 12 which is the latest version or 13. Save the file and once again Maven update project well actually you don't have to do that now but now we don't have any errors if I run the program I should be able to see this file created in this location let me delete this for you and run it again and it works but the key thing to note here is this dependency part we're going to use the maven dependency feature in coming lectures before we dive in to understand what is Spring Boot, let us try to understand the life before Spring Boot. Well, first of all, I want to clarify that Spring Boot is not any innovative technology. It's just an extension of existing Spring Framework and is there to address some of the problems created by Spring Framework. So first, let's talk about the problems and then we'll talk about how Spring Boot is going to address those problems with a solution. Imagine that you're a developer and typically as a developer when you're working on a project you'd have to go through all these steps. First of all you would create the project using a project management tool like Maven or Gradle and once you do that you have to figure out all the list of dependencies that your project ever needs, search them on the internet and add all those dependency tags inside your pom.xml file. Now this may sound simple but practically speaking this is going to consume a lot of time especially if you're working on large scale projects. And if you're writing a web application you would obviously need a container like a Tomcat server. So you do have to install Tomcat server, install it and even configure it on the IDE because only then you can run your applications from within your IDE. In addition to that if your application is data driven then you have to install a database software like PostgreSQL which is one of the popular databases or MySQL or Oracle DB, MongoDB or whatever it is. And only after going through all these steps you get to focus on writing the application logic. And story doesn't end here. You have to take care of bringing in a lot of configuration in place. If you've worked on any of the Spring projects before you probably know what I'm talking about. You have to configure a dispatcher servlet, a view resolver to resolve the views, etc. And if you're using a database, you have to bring in additional components like configuring the database parameters, data source, entity manager, etc. If you're not aware of Spring Framework, then just assume that there's a bunch of configurations that would help you run your application. And of course, in order to run your application on this server, you have to build the project and then you get an artifact which you can then deploy it on the server in order to see it running. In case if you come across with any errors, you have to repeat the entire process again and again in order to see your changes getting reflected. So what is the problem in here? The real problem is you as a developer are supposed to pay attention to step number five but you are forced to pay attention to a lot of other aspects that would help you run your application. So how about having a tool that would let you focus on step number five while all the other tasks will be taken care of by that tool? Well, that's exactly what Spring Boot does. Spring Boot is going to take care of all the steps and would let the developer focus on writing the application logic. Well, with simple Hello World application, you probably don't find this all that great. But imagine working on large-scale projects. If developer is spending so much time in other aspects, that's going to cost a lot of time. And so the project deliveries would be delayed, which is not good for any company. Here is the official definition of Spring Boot from the official website spring.io. And here is what they have to say. Spring Boot makes it easy to create standalone production grade Spring based applications that you can just run. We take an opinionated view of the Spring platform and third party libraries so you can get started with minimum fuss. Most Spring Boot applications need very little Spring configuration. Well, this definition certainly may not make sense at this point of time, 
because you don't know anything about Spring Boot just yet. We're going to take a look at an example of Spring Boot and then we'll get back on this definition and then you will understand this definition on your own. Here are some of the many features supported by Spring Boot but again I'm not going to talk about these. We'll talk about them after we take a look at an example of Spring Boot. That way these features would make more sense. Okay, let us take a look at how we can create a Spring Boot project from scratch. There are multiple ways to do so, but the approach that I'm going to follow in this video is by using so-called a Spring Tool Suit, which can be installed as a plugin in your Eclipse environment. We're going to explore the other options in coming time. So go to Help, Eclipse Marketplace, and search for that plugin, Spring Tool suit. Alternatively you can download the zip file from the internet and install the plugin manually from Eclipse home directory. But before you try to install this plugin, do make sure that you have the latest version of Eclipse installed. Get all the updates and keep the software up to date. In my case since I've already installed this particular plugin, it is showing as installed but you go ahead and install it accepting all the prompts. You can leave everything to their defaults. And once you install this plugin, by the way this plugin is from Pivotal. Make sure you don't install any other random plugin that you're seeing in here. Once you install that plugin, just go to File, New, go to Other and search for Spring. You should be able to see this. Spring Starter Project. You will not be able to see this unless you install that particular plugin. If you are familiar with creating Maven projects in Eclipse IDE, then this interface in here will look very familiar to you. The first field in here is the URL. That's where the Spring Initializer is residing. We're going to talk about it in a while. The name is going to be your project name. You can give any name of your choice and the type of project management tool. In my case it's Maven so I would leave it to default. If you're using Gradle then you can choose either of these options. The packaging part is a little tricky if you're coming from Java background without much of an exposure to Spring Boot and Cloud Architecture then you may be tempted to choose var archive here. But in our case, we're going to be needing jar file. This jar file in here is different from typical jar file that we're used to. When we think of a jar file, we would think of it as a bunch of dot class files. But in this case, this is not a simple jar file. It's called a fat jar. It's a world in itself. Because the fat jar is going to constitute everything to run your application. So it's going to constitute all the libraries that your application ever need, including the servers where your application would be running. So the resulting jar file is something that you can just run with a simple command and you would see your web application running. Well, it will make sense in a while. However, if you're not going to use the embedded servers, but you want to deploy your application on an existing Tomcat server located elsewhere, then you can create a var archive and then take care of deploying it over there. For now, just choose jar. You also can choose the JVM language of your choice. In my case, I'm going to be using Java. I would leave it to default. You can also choose the Java version. I'm going to leave this to default for now. And everything else you're seeing in here is something specific to Maven. There are certain naming conventions that you need to follow. So if you're not aware of Maven, I would recommend you to type in exactly what was typed in here. And after you do so, click next. Here you would get to choose so-called a starter project dependencies. Now these are a little bit different from project dependencies because typically in a Maven project, you would choose all the set of dependencies or libraries required in your project. Here you would choose the technologies that you're going to use in your project. 
For example, let's say my application needs a database, something like PostgreSQL. Well, you can just simply choose this and Spring Boot will take care of including all the dependencies required to run a query in this database. Or if you're using a cloud service like Amazon Web Services, then you can choose one of these. Or Microsoft Azure, you can choose one of these. In our case, we're going to keep things simple for now. And I'm just simply going to be needing a Tomcat server to run our application. And if you simply hover your mouse over there, you can actually see the description. If you select this particular starter dependencies, then you'll get everything in place to start working or building a RESTful web service or serving web content with Spring MVC or to build a REST service with Spring. And this is exactly what I'm going to be needing. So this comes with embedded Tomcat server as well. So there is no need to you installing the server separately. Again, once we create and run the application, all these would make perfect sense. So you need to hold on till that point and click next. In here, you can actually see the URL that is being used to send the request to the Spring Initializer. Let's quickly take a look at what's happening in here. Control C, go to browser and see what's going on there. So whatever you have done so far using Spring Tool Suite, you pretty much do the same stuff in here as well. So you would choose either Maven or Gradle, you would choose the language, Spring Boot version, which we will just simply leave it to default, and then project metadata. Here are the Maven coordinates with proper naming convention. And then finally, you would get to choose all the dependencies required in your project or for your application. So here are the list of dependencies or the technologies essentially that you get to choose. And finally, after you choose everything, you can click this button, generate project, which will generate a zip file, which you can import it as a Maven project inside your Eclipse environment. And that's essentially what's going to happen here as well. This is a URL that is being used to send the request to that server to perform the initialization process and then get back the result as a zip file, which this tool will import it into our Eclipse environment and sort of create a project that we can work on. So let's hit finish. It's going to take a while. And here we have it. We just created the Spring Boot application. We do seem to have one error. Let's take a look at what's happening in there. Well, I don't see anything that we need to fix. I'm assuming that this is shown by mistake. Anyway, let's leave it there and and I will see you soon. And I will see you soon. Okay, let us explore what's going on in this project real quick. What you have here is pretty much a standard Maven directory structure. You have source main Java directory within which you have this package, com.company. This is something that you specified while creating the project using Spring Tool Suite. And inside this directory, you can have all your source files. Spring Tool Suite also generated one file for us. We'll explore it in a bit. We also have the resources folder within which you can keep all your static resources like images, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. Or if you're using any kind of a template engine like Timeleaf, you can keep all those templates in this directory. So what's the big deal in here? Everything looks pretty normal, right? Nothing significant. Well, all the magic is happening right here in this pom.xml file. So let's explore what's happening in there. First, let's take a look at the dependencies part. Remember while creating the project, you have chosen web as a starter dependency. Well, here you have it. One of the features of Maven is that when you specify a particular dependency, 
Maven will not only download that particular dependency, but also the dependencies that this dependency depends on. For example, say that your project is dependent on project A and project A is dependent on project B. When you specify project A as part of the dependency, Maven will not only download project A jar file, but also B's because A is dependent on B. That's called transitive dependency. I hope I made myself clear. So with Spring Boot, you have this dependency in here and inside this particular project, Spring Boot Starter Web, you would have all the libraries or dependencies that you ever need to run your web application. If you're using Eclipse, you can press Ctrl and you can explore what's inside the pom.xml file of this particular project. And if you notice, you would come across with all the dependencies that would ultimately help you run web applications. Without Spring Boot, you would have to define all these dependencies yourself. You have to spend time doing research on what are all the libraries required and then find the right versions and then include all those dependencies in here. Well, with Spring Boot, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is to specify the technology that you want to use and you're good to go. Another key thing to notice here is you don't have to specify the version. Version will be managed by so-called a parent POM. You would specify the parent POM with this tag parent and you would give the project coordinates. So let's take a look at what's inside the parent POM. Again, you can press on control and you can click on this project. And here's the parent POM. Spring Boot dependencies and this will have all the dependencies, plugins, properties, configurations that you would ever need for any kind of Spring project. And all these would be inherited into your child project. But do take a note, here you would see literally all the dependencies that Spring Boot ever supported. Spring Boot doesn't include all these dependencies and plugins automatically in your child project. The reason being you may not be needing all those dependencies, right? You're not going to work on Amazon Web Services or you're not going to use a MongoDB or whatever. So you don't have to include all those dependencies and increase the size of your resulting artifact. But what you can do is you can specify the dependency that you need and rest of the configurations would be inherited from the parent POM. And so we don't have to specify the version number in here because it is being inherited from the parent POM. Let me search for this particular artifact inside the parent POM. And here you have it. This version number would be inherited right here inside your project. Same is the case with the plugins and other configurations. All those configuration details would be inherited only when you need them. You can actually control the Spring Boot version itself. In this case, we're using 2.1.5. You can change the version if you wish and accordingly, specific parent POM would be targeted and so are the dependencies versions. So you don't have to really manage the dependencies yourself, including their version numbers. All that headache will be taken care by all these Spring Boot projects. We also have a plugin, which is Spring Boot Maven plugin. It's really crucial that you have this plugin in place because this is what is going to create what I call a runnable fat jar. We'll talk about this plugin once after we run our project. But again, you just specified the plugin that you want to use. You didn't specify any of its configurations. All those configuration details would be fetched from its parent POM. Okay, it's time to bring life to our application by writing some logic. So now we're going to be introducing some presentation as well as the controller logic. But before that, we need to choose one of the template engines that are available in the market. One of the popular options with Spring is Timeleaf and there is also free marker and we have Apache Velocity which is now of course outdated. You can even use JSP without any problem. 
but the one that I've chosen for this particular video is Apache Free Marker. If you're not familiar with Apache Free Marker, that's fine. If you're familiar with any other UI technology, like say, for example, JSP, you can understand Free Marker pretty easily because all these UI technologies are pretty much in the same page and they pretty much have the same syntax. So this shouldn't be surprising to you. But one thing that we need to do is to add the starter dependency. I copied it from the internet and I have it handy. And so I'm pasting it in here. I'll do Control Shift F to give proper indentation. And then once you add the dependency, you need to do a Maven update of the project so that all the dependencies, including the transitive dependencies, would be downloaded from the remote repository to your local repository by Maven. So let's do that real quick. So now we have all the free marker libraries in place. The next thing is to just introduce the code. By the way, we didn't talk about this particular dependency which is added by default. Typically in any kind of a project, you would definitely have unit tests in place, right? And so Spring has added this dependency to test your application. More on it at a later point of time. So I already have the code handy with me. Our goal of our application is to show an input field to the user along with the submit button. When the user enters his or her name and clicks the submit button, the request would then go to the server and so to the controller based on the request mapping. And the request mapping text will match with this action text in here. And so we can say that the request would hit this particular method. And in the process, we're also reading the URL parameters. I mean, whatever the name that the user enters will be read and stored inside this parameter name. And inside this method, we're just simply populating this particular object, model and view. This is the view name that we want to render back along with the results. And I'm adding a couple of attributes which will be read from inside the view. So after we return this particular object, Spring Framework will take care of giving this object to the dispatcher servlet. Dispatcher servlet will take help from the view resolver to identify the right view based on the name as well as the extension. And it would forward the model data, these couple of attributes to that particular view. And so we're able to read the information from that view. So let's quickly introduce this particular page, which is going to be the home page. So it's going to have the name index dot whatever the technology that you use. In my case, it's free marker. So it's going to be FTL is the extension for free marker. We already have the templates directory and here is where it would go. So it's going to be index.ftl. Similarly, I'm going to introduce another free marker file to display the results. But do make sure that you name it with the exact name. And there's just one last thing before we can magically run our application is to introduce the controller logic. Let me copy this piece of code and create a new class file inside this. Hello world controller dot Java. Control Shift O to import all the classes and interfaces. And Control Shift F. The code is indented properly anyway. And that's it. We seem to have an error, of course. We didn't mention the package. Let's do that real quick. 
And will you believe me if I say that we are done? We are good to go and run our application. The answer is yes, that's the beauty of Spring Boot. So let's run this particular file. Now we're definitely going to get into details of how this is working and stuff like that in a while. But for now just run the application and see if that's working. I would choose Spring Boot app. Hit OK. And if you notice the results here, you would notice that the embedded server is started at port 8080. Even the servlet engine has been started. Even the web application context is created, including the root application context. And even the Spring is able to identify the index.ftl file, which will be the default page that gets rendered when we visit the URL. In our case, our server is hosted in the same PC, so it's going to be a local host. And let's go to browser and type in localhost and then 8080. Hit enter and hopefully things will go well. Uh, something is terribly wrong. Let's take a look at what's going on inside the index.ftl file. Oh, there you go. We're supposed to paste this code. Sorry about that, real quick. A quick fix. Save the file. Stop the program and run it again. Everything is as expected. Let's reload the page. Let me type in something. Uh, you can type in your name, but I'm going to type some something, whatever it is. Click submit. And there you go, it worked. But now the million dollar question, how did this happen? This looks very magical, right? Well, the magic is happening in this particular instruction. I will explain it in a while. Okay, let's take a look at this magical file that is doing a lot of stuff. Let's break it down and first start with this annotation. Although you're seeing single annotation in here, it is actually a combination of multiple annotations. So this is one of the convenience provided by Spring Boot. Instead of you having to define or declare all these annotations, you can just declare one annotation. The first annotation would just say that this particular file is the Spring Boot config file. I mean, if you worked on Spring projects before, and when you define your config file where you would list down all the beans, you would annotate it with at the rate configuration. Well, this is exact same annotation, but for Spring Boot. And secondly, you have this enable auto configuration, which will enable the auto configuration, meaning whatever the dependencies that you add in the pom.xml file, Spring Boot will try to make a guess on what would be the ideal configuration. So you don't have to create configurations. As an example, we never declared our dispatcher so that it was all taken care by Spring Boot. And even let's say that you're going to introduce some ORM framework like Hibernate, then you can just provide the starter dependency and Spring Boot will take care of creating the configuration. And for a dependency like Hibernate, you would need a data source, entity manager, and a host of other configuration details, which will be taken care by the Spring Boot. You can also override certain configurations if you wish, but more on it later. We also have this component scan annotation and this particular annotation would enable Spring Boot to scan all the beans in our project. I mean all the classes that are annotated with at the rate controller, at the rate service or at the rate repository etc. All those components would be discovered if you specify this particular annotation. And the other annotations are not of a great significance. Once you specify this annotation, you have to 
call this method run of Spring application class. And here in this annotation, we have actually enabled a lot of stuff, but it is in this class where the actual action will take place. So it's going to create the application context wherein you will have all the singleton instances. And it will also register a command line property source to expose command line arguments, meaning uh, this has something to do with externalized configurations, which we'll talk about at later point of time. And it would also help in refreshing the application context. Again, as we progress through the course, you will see these features being used. But ultimately, for now, you can think of this as this is going to kickstart our application or bootstrap our application by combining everything that we defined and finally help us launch our application. Also, it's worth mentioning that we're not really creating a var archive and then deploying into the embedded server. This is going to work a little different. I mean, if you were to create a var archive, then you should be having a web apps directory, right? And moreover, we didn't build our project. We just run this file and everything is working. And our application is working great. So this is a jar archive we're talking about. Another thing to note is for testing purposes, we developers may actually run this main method, but in production, this is not how it's going to work. In production, we would actually deploy the jar file and that jar file works as a standalone application, meaning you can run that jar with just a single command. And we can create that jar. If you remember, we call it a fat jar that would have everything in place. It would have all the embedded servers, libraries, configurations, and whatnot, everything to help run your application. In order to create that particular jar file, we can right click on the project go to maven or rather run as maven build it is successful well in my case i have used an existing configuration but you may be required to provide a goal. Let me show you what I mean. Here is where you need to mention the goal. And the goal that we are focused on right now is package. We want to package everything as a jar archive. Because if you remember, that is artifact type we have chosen. We've done that while creating the project using Spring Initializer or Spring tool suit. I believe it would default to jar file. And after the build is successful, you would see that the target directory, let me just quickly refresh this, has this artifact in place. Let's go to that directory and take a look at what's inside this file. I'm going to use the software 7-zip. To take a look at what's inside it and if you go to meta inf you would notice this manifest file and it has specified our class file spring boot application which is the starting point this is the file that we have run to see our application working and when you run this jar using a command in windows it's java hyphen jar and the name of the jar file that would uh, bootstrap everything but internally this is the class that gets called let me just show you real quick so before you run the command make sure that you terminate all this otherwise we'll have port conflict so i'm going to go here and location where our jar file is residing.
java hyphen jar oops okay our directory seem to have not changed so it's going to be slash d still no i guess i have to use the other slash and there you have it java hyphen jar and let's run it and you're seeing the same result let's go to browser refresh and it worked okay let us revisit our previous slides and see if our perception about spring boot has improved a bit so typically without spring boot these are all the steps that you need to follow but with spring boot you need to follow the step number one create the maven or gradle project but you don't have to follow this step number two in here which is to find the required dependencies or libraries that your project needs of course we need to add the starter dependencies but you don't have to add a whole list of libraries that your project ever needs you just have to focus on what technologies you would need in your application not what libraries you would need in your application and that's going to save a significant amount of time I mean tell me if it is easier to find a one single starter dependency or 100 different library dependencies obviously you would prefer to find one tag so I don't consider this all that of a pain and would exclude from the list of things that you need to do in case of Spring Boot. Coming to step number three, we didn't install any software, we didn't install any Tomcat server or installed it or even configured it. It's all taken care of by Spring Framework with an embedded server. And same is the case with step number four. Although we haven't used database, even if we had to, we don't have to install a database software. And then, of course, we need to write the application logic. Coming to step number six, create a config file defining all your beans. We didn't define our dispatcher servlet or the view resolver or even our controller. It's all taken care of by Spring Boot. And again, we didn't use database, but even if we had to use, you can leverage the auto configuration functionality and let the Spring Boot do the configuration for you. But if you want to overwrite some of the parameters, you can do that. We'll talk about that later. And then you don't have to follow step number eight in order to see your application working. You don't have to bundle your project as a var archive, manually copy that var file into your Tomcat server and then test it. That's a very long and lengthy process. You just have to run one single file. That's it. You'll see your application working. So pretty much everything is automated by Spring Boot except step number one and five. And be happy that these steps are not automated, otherwise we don't have jobs today. Let's move on and try to understand definition. Now this definition will make 100% sense to you. Well, hopefully. Spring Boot makes it easy to create a standalone production grade Spring based applications that you can just run exactly what has happened we take an opinionated view of spring platform and third-party libraries which means auto configuring depending on the type of libraries that you add in your project or the type of starter dependencies that you add configuration is taken care of by spring boot that's what this statement means and so you can get started with minimum fuss which means Spring Boot will try to auto configure everything, but if you're not happy with it or if you want to make some amendments, you still have the flexibility to do that. So majority of the job will be taken care of by Spring Boot. You just have to take care of a few minor things if you want to. And most Spring Boot applications need very little Spring configuration. And the features would sound very obvious to you now, at least a few of them automatically configure components and third-party libraries of course this is true it is very evident in our sample application 
create standalone Spring applications with embedded servers, very true, provide opinionated starter dependencies, super true, provide externalized configuration is something that we'll talk later, and provide developer tools, which is again something we'll talk later. These are all little advanced. Use actuator advanced and provides testing utilities, uh, not now. So at least you have some good overview on what is Spring Boot and I believe you're convinced of the fact that it is going to save a lot of developers time as the developer don't have to pay too much attention on creating the environment to run the application but rather spend a lot of time in creating the application itself. And that's the major problem that Spring Boot is trying to solve. Alright, I hope it makes sense. Have a great day. I'll see you soon.